Nehemiah chapter 2. Verse and you verse, they got me bored on everything. Good evening, good evening, good evening. We are glad to have you with us tonight as we jump in our Bible study lesson. Tonight we are in Nehemiah chapter number two. Nehemiah chapter number two. God blessed us on last week. Uh, we dealt with Nehemiah chapter one and enlightened us a little bit on Sunday morning with it. And tonight we are in chapter two of Nehemiah. And we really want to talk about Nehemiah's commission. Ne Nehemiah's commission. And uh, even before I pray, I, I, I'd like to remind the viewing audience and those that's here that whenever you read the Bible, st step into the page of the Bible to see where you fit. St step in there and say, um, am I Nehemiah? Am, am, I, am I king or the Xerxes? I, you know, am I, am I Sambalik or Tobias? You know, ask yourself, where, where, do, where do I fit in the page of Scripture here today? And if you fit like somewhere tonight, like Nehemiah, how can it relate to your life and your ministry right now? And everyone is in churches across the world, uh, part of ministry, whether you know it or not, whether you have a license, whether you have a title, you, you're an active part of some ministry, whether you happen to hurt, you, you're actively involved in ministry. And so tonight we're in Nehemiah chapter 2, Nehemiah, no, the cupbearer, the, the wall restorer, the builder. And so we're going to look at him tonight. Let's open up with prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you once again for your uh, love, kindness, tender mercies that you bestow upon us each and every day. God, we thank you for allowing us to see a new day, a day which we have not seen before. And once it is gone, we will not see it again. So tonight, I ask you the word, these old lips of clay, let it be a mouthpiece and I be the vessel for you tonight that those that hear your word tonight will be made better because of your word tonight. And strengthen us as we strive down here in, in Tree Mutt here in Savannah, Georgia. Do your will and your work. Be with us, God, as a keep us. Not only here, but I ask you to bless churches and pastors everywhere. God, continue to keep us on your ark and save this our prayer. It's in the precious and matchless name of Jesus we do pray. Amen, amen, amen. Tonight, uh, we're going to journey into Nehemiah chapter number two. Uh, here in chapter two of Nehemiah, it gives us Nehemiah's commission. What, 
what what is he called to do? As you jump into pages, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, what is it God has called me to do? Now, we know everybody in churches, God didn't call everybody to be preaching. I know there's some churches that have a lot of preachers. That's, that's, that's them, and God called them there. But God did not call everybody to be a preacher. But everybody is called to do something. And so uh, before this, we were dealing with your gift. So is it my gift? Or what is it, God, you have me to do? What are, have you commissioned me to do? I will tell you what God didn't commission you to do, just to come and sit down and do nothing. It's easy to come to church and don't ever do anything and show up next week. Listen, that's something we can do, whether it's ministering and witness to our family members, co-workers, our employee, our caretaker. God has commissioned all of us to do something. Uh, Nehemiah here in chapter 2, known as the cupbearer, he stands before the king. And we're going to see that here in verse 1 and 2. He stands before the king. And, and these first two verses are so powerful. hope I can bring to light so really how powerful Verse 1 and verse 2 is because it's at this point that Nehemiah is really going against the grain. At this point, Nehemiah makes a decision that, that put his life in jeopardy. Nehemiah at this point makes a decision whether he's going to be powerful or popular. So you got to understand here, Nehemiah makes a choice to stand before the king. Even though he was a cupbearer, there were just certain things you didn't do. But Nehemiah knew that it was important for him his nation, the children of God, to return back to Israel or Jerusalem there and to the holy city. Verse 1 and 2, I'll be reading from, I always read uh, Bibles the most time from a modern translation, but I'm reading from the New American, uh, New King James Version. New King James Version, uh, we'll be looking at it. It says, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Xerxes, when wine was before him. That I took the wine and gave it to gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad since you are not sick? That's nothing but sorrow. Uh, that this is nothing but sorrow heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. Look here, it says it gives the timeline when it was. He said, I took the wine and gave it to the king. The last verse of Nehemiah 1, if you remember, Nehemiah, it said Nehemiah was a cupbearer. It's just like it just, why is that even in there? But it's a, a significant, it, it is a significant position in the ancient royal court as a cupbearer. The cupbearer was really like a bodyguard for the king. Uh, he would taste the food and the wine uh, prior to the king. Uh, consuming it, just to ensure that no one was trying to poison the king or kill the king. Uh, the cupbearer was a high fish in the royal household who basically, uh, basically his duty was, uh, was choosing and tasting the wine uh, and, and demonstrated his loyalty to the king and the royal court just in case someone tried to poison. It, it's good to, to have people to, to fight with you, but, it, but the cupbearer, he was willing to die for the king. And at this point, he had to have some type of close relationship with the king enough that the king could tell something was wrong. Matter of fact, uh, as a cupbearer, he was around the king. And if you was ever in the king's presence, it was disrespectful to be sad or down or depressed. Because during this time, Brother John, it, it was thought that if, if you was in the king's presence, that should be just enough for you to have joy. Just because you're in the king's presence, that should just be enough to be happy. It almost reminds us just being like in the presence of our king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Just to be in his presence, we should be happy. We should be excited. And the king himself saw uh, Nehemiah's face, and he asked him, what is wrong? He said, therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you're not sick? Uh, and, and at this point, that's why I say Nehemiah really put his life in jeopardy because he could have said anything. He could have said, I'm sick. Because if he's in the king's presence and he's not excited, that means he's not excited about the king. And so Nehemiah, Nehemiah uh, he, he said, this is nothing but sorrow heart. The king says, this is something wrong with your heart. You're not sick. What's going on in your heart? And so at this point, Nehemiah became dreadfully afraid. 
He was afraid because at this point, I'm in the king's presence, and he can see that something's not right. I'm not happy. I'm sorrowful. I'm sad. I'm depressed, and he's going to kill me because he's going to think it's about him. Have you walked in the room and everybody looking at you and start whispering? Now, you don't know what they said, but who do you think they're talking about? You, you just walked in, everybody whispered. The king was going to assume, everybody thought the king was going to assume that he was depressed because of him. It was culturally, uh, it was a custom that cult- throughout the culture, that if you was in the king's presence, you got excited. Amen? And so, it said, so he was down, he was depressed, and that's why he was afraid, because he thought he was going to lose his life. He said, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Xerxes, uh, as Nehemiah gave, uh, gave wine to the king, uh, he gives specific dates and time when it was, so we kind of track when this was. Uh, the date is also important because it established the date given to restore Jerusalem and its wall. This is how we know about it. If you go back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, it says exactly uh, 173,880 days from this day, which would have been like March 14. Uh, 455, 45 B.C. So we have dates. This is how they can calculate the dates. Uh, whenever you see a time stamp like in the month of, on the 20th year, or the 20th day, those are dates. Now, our calendar, we calculate it as, you know, uh, uh, January the 5th or March 14th, things like that. But this gives us a time stamp when it happened. He said, I had never been sad in this presence before. On this particular day, Nehemiah know that he had never been sad or depressed in the presence of the king. H- have you ever been depressed around folk, but they didn't know it? Then all of a sudden, it just, you just can't hold it no more. You, you, you've been, you, you have, but, but what had troubled Nehemiah began to show up on the outside. I want you to understand, sometimes the stuff just come out. You don't, you don't held it for years because we believe at this point Nehemiah had been praying for some time. Uh, because we saw in the last chapter, his brother stuff came to him, and, and other men came to him and told him the state of Jerusalem. So we see here, it was at this point, he'd never been sad before. There are times, my sister and brother, that we can fake it. But there's some times you just can't hold it in. Nehemiah, he, 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 was, he, was, he had never been sad in his presence before. Does that mean Nehemiah had never been sad? He just wasn't never sad around the king. Why? One, he didn't want to die. So, you know, because you sat around the king, you saying, hey, you're not happy about your king, and you're the cupbearer, you may try to kill me. Uh, he became dreadfully afraid. Uh, and said, and said th- this is nothing but sorrow. Uh, this is nothing but sorrow. Near mind of the king had noticed his sadness. And I'm going to tell you, we can try to fool folk, but people sometimes can look at us and tell something's wrong. Amen? Brother Josh, sometimes I, I, I look at my wife. She has to say, well, I say, what's wrong? She say, nothing. I say, okay, what's wrong? Nothing. I said nothing. She, she may tell me nothing, but I can tell. And then later on, she may, and then that time, I'm like, she said, what's wrong, Quinn? I say, nothing. To me, I'm saying nothing because I'm really saying I don't want to talk about it. I don't know why she says nothing. Maybe she don't want to share with me. But people that's close to you can tell something's wrong. And so he said, that's nothing but sorrow heart. The king knew at this point that something was wrong with Nehemiah, and Nehemiah became afraid. Amen. In, in the comments, the question up to verse number 2, verse 1 and 2. He fasted and prayed first. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 Since you talk about the order here, what was the hierarchy? Now, Nehemiah wanted to rebuild the city in Jerusalem. The hierarchy is, who did he go to first? He went to God, then he went to who? You see how, he, how the order is right here? 
When we want to do things, who do we go to first? Sometimes we start at the bottom up, and then by the time we get to the king, it done changed. Who all did Nehemiah tell at this point that you know of? That you know of. We're going to talk about it. At this point, nobody but God and the king. If God, Dick Parker, if God has put something in your heart to do, you have to be careful when you share with everybody. Uh, I, I don't care how, how great a plan it may be, because we're going to see go through the chapter that, that some people just heard about what Nehemiah wanted to do, and they became disgruntled. And sometimes you can share what God has put in your spirit. If you're not prayed up and fast like Nehemiah here, they can discourage you because, like I said, Ezra had tried, and I believe other people have had tried. It wasn't recorded because, you know, you had two, two to three million people that was in exile, and now they're free, only 50,000 come back. I believe there was somebody else besides Nehemiah that, that probably desired to, 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 to go back in, but because of enemy attacks, because of the naysayers, because of what it looked like, I believe their they mind was changed. But Nehemiah prayed. The hierarchy went to God first, and then he went to the next line and went to the king. Now, does the king do anything? Does the king, does the king go lay any block or uh, build, build anything that you know of? But the king will give the blessing. Now, now this is what I'm saying, Digger Roll. I, even as pastors, I don't have to teach the Sunday school. But before you just go start a Sunday school class at your house, at least start at the top, let the top know about it. Because if he hadn't given the blessing, Nehemiah could have lost his life and blessing would have been cut off and the last thing he had wouldn't have happened. So sometimes we miss our blessing because the order is not in place. Yes, sir. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Yeah, yeah. See, I like them types too. They're red, red head, amen. You, you probably a scholar in school, amen. <laughs> and see, that's, that's what I'm getting at. People that, that when, you, when the order is in place, God has set blessings up for you that you didn't know you needed. And we wonder why things not come to place, because we started in the wrong place. Amen. And thank you, uh, uh, brother. Look at this verse number three. Here is Nehemiah's response. Now, the king did pretty much notice Nehemiah, but in, in verse three, we see Nehemiah's response. And he said, and said to the king, may the king live forever. Listen, I want you to understand, king, I'm, on, I'm with you. Why should my face not be sad, sad when the city, the place of my father's tomb, lies waste and his gates are burned with fire? Nehemiah had probably said these words plenty of times before, you know, may the king live forever. That's something they would commonly say to kind of let you know we praise the king, we love the king, we support the king. But this was probably almost a model for some of them just to say that. But this time it was a little different, Nehemiah. Since, the, since, the taste, since they taste the wine and ate the food before the king, they would always say, we, we honor you, king. But he said, my, my, my burden that I'm bearing has nothing to do with the king. The city, the place of my father's house, or in King James' sepulchral base where they was buried at, in lying waste, the gates are still burned with fire. He said, with this, Nehemiah explained why he was sad. Jerusalem was destroyed, and it was a, a disgrace to his heart. When the believers fall down, churches fall down, things, it should be a disgrace for us to see God's holy city just crumble. Go back home, uh, dig a roll and see some of the places. Go see your old high school, and you can tell the stories about it to your children, and you go back and take them to school, and, and, that, and the, the, the building barely standing up. Let me go take this place. You go get my, get my sandwiches from my, this cafe. You go there, it's, it's about tore down. And they're like, wow, this is it? Imagine the holy city had fortified walls that was, the wall was so wide that the chariots could race around and now it's been destroyed and God had promised them and now it lay waste. And why should my face not be sad? It bothers me as a pastor. It bothers me as a Christian when believers can't praise God. It bothers me as a believer when people, you have the force and poke and prime to get people to give God praise. I know everybody has their own reason for everything. But, but the pandemic kind of shook some of us up. It, it kind of separated a little bit of the wheat from the tear. And, and, and you see here, it bothered Nehemiah so much that his face was sad. 
No one had to tell the king uh, this, the disgraceful state. Uh, uh, he would immediately sympathize with, with Nehemiah's concern. We, we see also Nehemiah's great track and wisdom. Well, he, he had enough wisdom to go to the king first. And because he tells the current concern without specifically mention any other city, he ain't talking about what they who done it, he ain't talking about the Babylonian, he ain't talking about uh, where we at now and uh he, he, and, and search seats. Uh, uh he didn't talk about no other, he just talked about my my father's house. He said, Why should my face not be sad? Many people are troubled by this dilemma. No one wants to be the Want to be a whine and nobody want to bore others other with their problem. Nobody want to be the first to complain. But sometimes there should be some stuff that bothers you and you're not complaining. And many believers see that stuff bothers them and they would never take the chance to stand before the king. Nehemiah risked his life to stand before the king. And we see at this point, once he kind of cracked the ice with the king, we're going to see that. The king shows him favor. Am I right about it? And when you go to God first, God will show you some favor. Uh, very seldom, uh, Digger Roland, have, have, I, have I told people know about doing work in the church? I, 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 very few things. Because somebody said, Pastor, we want to do this. And, and my heart like, if you want to do this, go ahead and do this. I'm not going to tell you no. And so, but guess what? Not only will I tell you yes, but guess what you're going to have mine? You're going to have my blessings. Not, not only am I blessing you with my blessing, but let me get somebody else to help you out. Amen? And so we see here in verses 8 and 4, and four through 8, we're going to see Nehemiah kind of get through that place with the king, and now he can make a, re make a request. In, in coming before we jump into verse 4. Here in verse 4 through 8. Uh, then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tomb, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen sent also uh, beside him, how long will the journey be? And when I when I, and, when, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Furthermore, furthermore, I said to the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me for the governor of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter, letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple for the city wall and for those uh, for the house uh, that I will occupy and the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me that, that's pretty powerful right there and the king granted them to me according to Nehemiah's good hand no he said the hand of my God that was upon me so here we see, what, what do you request? Right away, Nehemiah knew God had given him uh, the favor with the king. After he had talked with the king. And, and you can tell how the conversation going to go when you're talking to somebody. You can tell that this is not going to go right. But Nehemiah apparently saw that he had cracked the, cracked the code with the king, and the king didn't kill him. He had a little favor, so he said, uh, so the king not only showed the face, he said, what do you want? His response wasn't off the, he, he wasn't said off, uh, his response wasn't off with his head, I'm going to kill you, Nehemiah. The king said, what do you want? How can I help? We would be surprised what God would do for us when we go to him first. And Nehemiah basically said, I've been praying about this already. When, when he came to Nehemiah, the, uh, historians say he had been praying uh, several days, perhaps uh, four months already. He said, so, he, so I pray to the God of heaven, knowing his prayer had been answered at this point. Nehemiah said, I pray for this moment, and God has answered my prayer. 
Nehemiah prayed again. He said, this was not a long extended prayer. He said, he could have said, well, king, let me pray about it a few more days. Now, he already prayed. Uh, when, when, when you have the opportunity, you can't go get ready. You got to get ready. You, when they finna put you in a game, you can't go looking for your helmet. You can't be strapping up your shoulder pad. You got to be ready to play. And the king said, what can I do for you? He said, well, this is what I prayed about. With the wisdom, he said, I ask that you, you, you send me to Judah. That's where the king, southern king of Judah had two tribes, and the, uh, Jerusalem was in the southern kingdom. He said, send me to Judah. And Nehemiah, again, shows great wisdom and respect, asked uh, for opportunity to leave and be absent for the king. Because remember, he's working for who? He's working for the king. He just didn't leave work. He, he left and said, give me permission to go. He asked to leave, and um, he, asked, he asked for permission and near my vision was revealed. He said that I may rebuild. He said, what, what you want to go to Jerusalem for? He said that I may rebuild it. Listen, even if we come back to the church, we, we're not just coming back to view and see what everybody does. We should be coming back to help rebuild the city. Nehemiah cannot do it by himself. But guess what? Nehemiah said, I want to rebuild the city. So I need your blessings to be with me. So Nehemiah prayed about it. He said, man, what, what, what do you want the king uh, 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 said, what do you want? He said, after I prayed to God, I want your blessings to send me to Judah. And not only that, he said, I want to rebuild it. The city where my fathers and family has been buried. It hurt my heart. This, it should hurt your heart when your Jerusalem is, down, is, is in, 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 in ruins. It should hurt your heart when the holy city is burned to the ground. He said, it pleased the king, if it pleased the king to send me. Uh, so he said, so he said at the time, he said, how long you want to be there? His wife was right there. And, and this kind of intrigued me here, Digger Rowling. I don't know if his wife was something like Pilate's wife that tried to say Jesus didn't do anything wrong. But it, it puts it in there and said the king Xerxes' wife was there uh, for some reason. And, and the king then said, how long, how much time do you need? He gave him a set time. It's not specify how much time he gave, but he gave him a time. He said a time. He says, I also need some wood. God had blessed him with the time. He got letters because, see, because if Nehemiah had to went on his own accord, Nehemiah would have been killed. So the Hopkins said, Parker, when we try to do things ourselves, we don't know the enemy that's out there waiting on us. Nehemiah, before he went to the king, he knew that the enemies was out there because, like I said, Ezra had tried to rebuild the city. Others had tried to rebuild it. But he said, give me letters that I can be protected. Give me letters. Gave me letters. That I, and then no one said he need wood. He, he, uh, Asaph, the keeper of the wood, the forest, he wanted wood to rebuild a citadel. And so he, God allowed King Xerxes to give him letters to go to Jerusalem, give him wood. Jeru to go to Jerusalem, give him time to go to Jerusalem, and then I had a plan to rebuild a city. Ask yourself, believers, what's your plan? What's your plan to rebuild your holy city? What, what's your plan to get back in a place with God that you once was? Uh, get back to the place where you was at when God was just moving in your heart, but you got exiled into Babylon. Listen, there's going to be some time where we've all been exiled in Babylon. Your spirits are torn down. You're weak. And we're going to throw it down. And guess what? Your city is burnt down. It's in ruins. But it's up to you to have a vision like Nehemiah to say, I want to go back and rebuild my city. We're in Nehemiah chapter 2. In the question up to verse number 8. As we go into verse number 9, we can see Nehemiah, he comes to Jerusalem. He, um, and when you... Doing work for the Lord, think of honor, you're going to always face some opposition. Don't ever think it's going to be hello, hallelujah every Sunday. Don't think people are going to like you, like you, and tell you good, good sermon, good Sunday school class, great song, wonderful prayer. Listen, that's a joke. They're not always going to be there. As soon as Nehemiah, after 70 years of being in exile, 150 years of being, the city being destroyed, Hundred years nobody occupied. Nehemiah finally get there and he faced opposition. So I'm telling you, I don't care how great of a, a commissioner you may be, a, a counselor you may be, a, a politician you may be, be prepared for some opposition. Verse 9 through 10, he arrived 
And when he arrived, there's opposition. Look here in verse, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10, uh, verse 9. He said, then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letter. Now, he had to give them the king's letter because if he shows up to these other cities, and he's back in uh, Susan, where he was at there, uh, and he worked for King Archer Xerxes, it was almost like, quote, unquote, a runaway slave. And by him being in those other areas, they would have what? Perhaps killed him. But he went to these governors and showed them the letters beyond them. He said, now the king has sent captains of the army and horsemen with him. Why did he send captains of the army and horsemen with him? Why were they with him? For protection. Listen, I don't care how saved you are, you better make sure you have on the full arm of God. I don't care how great of a work you plan to do, there's going to always be some opposition that's going to come get you. And so, look what it says here. It says, when Samballot, the Hornite, and Tobias, the Ammonite, officer heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Listen, that's why I said back in, in verse 2, when I said, you have, you, that's why you got to talk to God first. Then he went to the king. He didn't go to nobody else. By the time the plan got out, God had already, had already allowed the king hard to be in a position that Nehemiah had the blessings of God and the king. Now, if God give you a plan and you go get on the telephone and tell everybody about it and do all this, guess what? You, you'll be here with them seven battles and Tobias before God even, before you even talk to God about it. At this point, had Nehemiah even picked up a brick? Had, had Nehemiah even really made it to Jerusalem yet? He just gave the governor letters that say, listen, I'm going to Judah, to Jerusalem, to rebuild the city. And Sambalic, the, Horn, the Hornonite, and Tobias, the Ammonite, officer heard of it, and they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. There are some people that want your Jerusalem to stay in ruins. There are some people that want you to always have a pity party. There are some people that's beyond the river that don't want you to be blessed. And that beyond the river is the Euphrates River. Uh, the Euphrates and the Nile River. We talk about beyond the river, that river, the Euphrates. Uh, he said, and then he gave them letters. Nehemiah came prepared because if he didn't have the letters, the mission of God would not have been accomplished. The hierarchy went to God, went to the king, and God gave him the blessing, and the king gave him everything he needed and protection. He gave him captains of the army and horses. He gave him some officers and some fighting soldiers to protect him. When you're doing the work for God and you go about the right order, God will bless you more than you ever know. I mean, I know it's a nice car, nice house. I mean, she looked good, he's, he smelled good, but you better pray about it first. That's a great job, great opportunity, but you better pray about it first. Because there's some Sambalics and Tobias at the governor's station. They may hear you talking about your plan that'll kill your spirit. A lot of people that, that have great success in their spirit and their loins and their, and their heart and their mind, they tell the wrong people first. And they can talk you out of and discourage you and sometimes tear down the plan that's been in operation. And this is not going to be the only time we're here about Sambalik and Tobiah. Now, they had nothing to do with them. How many times people destroy what God is doing and it has nothing to do with you? One is a Hornonite, one is an Ammonite. They're not Israelites at all. So the Israelites want to go rebuild their city. Y'all go ahead. They ain't got nothing to do with them. But there's some people that, want, that, that don't want to see you in a better posi position. There's some people that really don't want to see you blessed because God had promised them land, and Nehemiah was greatly troubled, and he had a desire to go do what God had called him to do, put in his heart. Any comments up, up to verse number 10, before we go to verse 10? Here in verse 11 through 16, uh, we see Nehemiah make a secret tour of Jerusalem and her wall. Why, before we get to it, why do you think he had to do it in secret? Back, he didn't want nobody to know, but um, also if he had done it publicly, people were going to try to kill him and stop the plan. 
there are some things you can't always do in the open. And I, even in the church setting in 2022, that's a, you still got to keep some secrets. Because <laughs> sometimes people, uh, all your moves can't be put on Facebook. And people think you, you tell everybody on the telephone, listen, I may tell you some stuff on the telephone, but I ain't telling you all everything. Because there's some, there's some, some Hornonites and Ammonites that want to destroy what God has put in your loins. Look here. And so he, he toured the city. He just toured the city wall by night. Let's look at verse 11 through 16. And I'm reading from New King James Version. It says, so I, so I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Look, there's something about those three days, y'all. Then I rose in the night. I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. He had people with him, but they didn't know what he was going to do. There's some time, uh, Brother Jai, that, that I, I, I can't just say what I'm going to do tomorrow because it may not be time to put out today because you put out today by the time tomorrow show up, the clan already there to tear it up. He said he told no one uh, what God had put in his heart to do at Jerusalem. Nor was there any animals with me except the one on which I rode. He'd have, he'd have a whole lot of stampede. It wasn't a lot of noise. He said, and I went out by night through the, through the valley gate to the, to the surface wall and to the refuge gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which was broken down, and its gates, which was burned with fire. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass, or uh, for under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the uh, 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 officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officers, I mean the officials, or the others uh, who did the work. I don't know how Nehemiah did this. I, I wish I could go through the school he went to, but he had people follow him, but they didn't know where he was going. <laughs> they didn't vote about it. They just, they, hey, we, we going. He didn't tell nobody what they was, he was doing, but the people followed him. I, 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 it, this is not black Baptist right here. <laughs> well, we go, we, well, why do we keep going to these different gates? We were just at the valley gate. Now we're going to the, the fountain gate. Now you're at the king's pool. We, we can't even get our animals up on through here. And listen, he didn't tell nobody, but guess what? The people were following him. He didn't tell. The, so there was Jews with the priests, nobles, officials, and others who were there to do the work. They were just ready to work. How powerful a church we can be if we just find some people. I'm ready to do what you want me to do. I, I ain't got to know what you want me to know. Uh, Dick and Ronnie, you remember your military days. Did you know what the generals knew? Did you know the uh, lieutenant generals, a matter of fact, the colonels or the majors? I'm going down in rank. Uh, uh, even the captain sometime. He just, when they told you, this is what I want the staff sergeant to do, that's what you've done. Because everybody else had something else to do. The problem in time as believers, we want to know everybody else's job. We want to do it. We want to know everybody else about it. Well, I'm doing this. Why I'm doing this? They ain't doing it. You don't know what they done before they showed up. Before we showed up, the, the scouts was already there. The rangers already there. SF been there years. And we just had to show up. Listen, if we do our part in ministry, we don't know what Nehemiah having planned. We don't know what God, matter of fact, I don't know if Nehemiah knew all but what God was going to do or how he was going to do it. He just, he just went and surveyed the land. We're in a time now, a, a post-pandemic, I want to call it post-pandemic, where we have to survey the land. These pews and churches throughout the America that were filled with certain people, they may be filled with different people, but we got to survey. What can we do to get people back in the church now? What can we do to get people back in the Sunday school? What can we do to get people back in the choir? What can we do to get people in a different place? It may be different people, because remember, two to three million people was exiled. Only 50,000 came back. That's, that's less than 2% of people. So you mean to tell me God blessed all these people to get to the promised land. They went through a hardship, and everybody said, you know what? I ain't going back. It looks bad. I ain't going back. Brother Jack, what you going to say? I saw it on your face. Yeah. 
Yeah, everything about now. Everything gave credit to God. Now these different gates are different size. Those they're trying to figure out the the valley gate. The valley gate was pretty much on the west side of the city, and uh, you got the uh, the other gates, the uh, fountain gate, was like on the east side. So basically, Nehemiah was just surveying the city uh, because we we don't have a a picture visual of these different gates, but if you had a visual, you'll see the different gates and the king's pool and different places. He didn't have a lot of people with him. He didn't bring all the horses with him. Matter of fact, just the one horse he was on. Uh, so we see that, that because everybody can't see the ruins and see it rebuild. Everybody can't see the city that's been burnt down for 150 years and see it a thriving city again. When I look out here, I see people I look out here, I see people in the background. I see, I see the chair. I see God moving. Now, I may not see the same folks I saw three years ago. But God say, you got to do a survey. What, what can we do differently? Amen. Uh, and so the wall of Jerusalem, which was broken down, and its gates were burned with fire. Nehemiah knew the job of rebuilding the wall. Couldn't go forth unless he saw exactly uh, how bad the situation was. If we're going to rebuild the situation, rebuild the wall, you first got to see how bad the situation is. Because at this point, Nehemiah hadn't been there. Chapter 1, he just got word by his brother and some other men what had happened. He had to see for himself. And there are some people just have heard about, but they hadn't went soft for themselves. Amen? Anybody want to add anything up to that, up to verse 16? Am I making sense? It, it, this, is like, this is like God jumped, jumped fast forward to 2022, 4,000 years ago, and put this in here that this can fit us right now. And so, uh, and I want you to understand, I may not be the Nehemiah. You may be the Nehemiah. You, you, somebody watch on Facebook may be the Nehemiah. But guess what? We got to rebuild the wall. Let's go to verse 17. In, in the comments over here. Ladies, y'all want to ask, Sister Hobbs, what you got? You got some good stuff. <laughs> Amen. And see, and so, so if, I'm, if I'm talking to somebody, I'm glad Sister Hobbs did this. So when, in, in years to come, I'm seeing this also, if we rebuild a wall. When I start talking about the fountain gate, I want, I want the media men to pull up the fountain gates on the screen up there. So the, what, what does it look like, Sister Hobbs? Tell us about it. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so as we read the Bible harmonically and harmon legs, what we talked about, you got to know these type things because you may just think of the fountain at, 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 at the park, at, 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 at uh, uh, Foresight Park, the fountain at Foresight Park. But those are different places giving us uh, identifiable marks of where he went. And the pool, and the king's pool, that just let him know he, he went to different places to look and see what, how bad it really was. If we really want to see how bad things really are, you just can't come on Sunday morning. If you want to see how bad things really are, you just can't watch it on YouTube or Facebook. You got to, you got to go to the different gates. You know, and, and you can't just, when I was a child, listen, things done changed since I was a child. I, I, you know, when I was in the eighth grade, it's different than when my child was in the eighth grade. You got to go look at those pools. Go to those different gates. And you'd be like, wow. And we can't depend on our kids to be taught by their parents about God because guess what? The parents don't know about God. When you was a child, they, you didn't just have to, you didn't just learn the 23rd Psalms in church. Guess what? You learned, you heard that at the house. Now we got grown-ups that don't know the 23rd Psalm or the Lord's Prayer. Or some people call it our Father's Prayer. Uh, and they just don't know. And we in the back with the youth talking about how to read the Bible for the youth. But guess what? I was like, hey, they ain't just a youth class. That could be an adult class, too, because some of us, most Bible reading we do is maybe when, when I'm reading scripture to them or, or something going on. But guess what? We all need to have a time where we read the Bible. We, times have changed. So you got to go to these different walls and different things. And so it's good to say that we can see those type of different type, type things happening. And so years to come, Sister Hopkins, when I talk about the, uh, the pool of Bethesda and the, and the sheep market and all that stuff, I, I want the media men to be listening for clues, and they can type it in and put it up there. And they, 
and they see it. So I'm, I'm speaking into the atmosphere, amen. So get ready, AV ministry. Speak it, amen. So we see here in verse 17 through 18, Nehemiah, he meets with the leaders of Jerusalem. Now, what's the hierarchy now? What's the hierarchy? Who, who are all Nehemiah talked with so far? He talked to God, the king, and now the leaders. Amen? And so the conversation that Nehemiah had with God is different than the king. The conversation you have with the king is going to be different than the leaders. But also, before he get to the people, he needs the leaders on board. Verse 17 through 18, Nehemiah meets with the leaders of Jerusalem. We see that here. It says, then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them on the hand of my God, which I have been upon, which have been upon me, and also the king's word that he has spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to the good work. Now, they don't have the people, but they have the support of the leaders, the king, and God. They did something that the faculty do. They, 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 they said, let's rise up. Those that's watching all the Falcons fans had like, huh. Now, I don't know what they're going on. They just got some new people last week now. Come on now. <laughs> he said, you see the distress that we're in. If, if the leaders don't see we're in distress, if the leaders is like everything is fine, get comfortable in the situation, we cannot expect the people to want things to change. It should bother the leaders that things are not better. It says, it says, it says, you see the distress that we are in. The citizens of Leah Jerusalem were not sitting around waiting uh, for Superman to come or alone rebuild a wall. Sometimes you have to rebuild a wall yourself. If the youth will not come to church, listen, let's load the van up, let's go get them. If we can't get the people in church, let's, let's put, send it to church to them. We, we, we got to do what we can to rebuild a wall. Said, then I said to them, now, when Nehemiah came to explain his vision, at this point, the first time he talked about his vision, rebuild a wall uh, to the leaders of the city, there was tremendous amount of importance, uh, uh, attention to the meeting. Nehemiah could not do the job by himself. I don't care how, how many schools I've been to, how long I've been preaching, I've been pastoring, what you think about me. I, as a pastor, I can't do it by myself. I don't care how great a youth leader you may be, Sister Hopkins, you can't do it by yourself. Digger Parker, you can try if you want to, but you lose the black hair you got. You can't do it by yourself. We need help to rebuild the wall. We don't need criticism. We don't need Tobias. We, we don't need any other people to tear it down. We need some people that say, let's rise up. Now, so did, did, did Nehemiah say, let's rise up? Who said that? Go back there at verse 18. He said, after he gave his vision, what did it, who said, let's, let us, let's, let's, let's rise up? What the King, King J may be a different translation. The leaders, the people he was speaking to said, let us rise up and build. You got to think, it's been 150 years. The holy city has been burnt down, been destroyed. And guess what? There's some people who want to see things turned around. Nehemiah really couldn't do it by himself. At this point, he had the support of the king. He had the support of God, had the support of the king. He had protection. He had wood. He had army to watch over him. Now he has leaders on board. And when you have people on board to move in, in the direction that God wants you to move in, opposition will sometimes rise up before you will. That's why you cannot be slowful, which the Bible talks about slowfulness. And, uh, and it talks about slothfulness is a sin. And that would be another thing I have my AV minutes. They'll pull it up. They'll pull up the scripture when they talk about slothfulness is a sin. You'll pull it up and you'll put it up on the board up there. So people won't think I'm making it up. And when, when you're slothful, and, and guess what? We take our time in doing things. We'll talk about it, vote on it, and we say we're going to do it. But guess what? While you waiting around, uh, Sam Balak and Tobias is going to do their job. 
The, the enemy's going to do it. Look here. They talk about let's rise up. But look at verse 19. It says, but when Sambalit the Hornonite and Tobias the Ammonite official and, and Gisham, the, hey, look, they're going to add somebody else now. The Arab heard of it. They laugh at us and despise us and said, what, a, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you re rebel against the king? They don't realize that they had the king's blessing. Now, if you're not strong-willed, people will make you think you're going against God's will because it's something different. For 150 years, you got to understand, the city had been torn down. And there have been, there have been some people that have become, become comfortable that in other places. And I want you to understand, we've been out of church going three years. We're just trying to get back into it. There are some people uh, that, that is, have some legitimate reason why they can't come back. They have elderly parents, have elderly spouse, sick people. But there are some people that just became comfortable. They, they, was in, they was in captivity so long, they went on to live their own life. Like I said, there were some people so comfortable in Babylon that, that, that some became leaders. You had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were leaders of Babylon. Daniel became a leader. Elsa became a queen to one of the kings. So they had become comfortable outside of Jerusalem. And if, you, if you're outside of uh, doing certain things for so long, it becomes common. I don't know how true it is. They say if you do something for 21 days, it becomes a habit. I don't quite make it 21 days. Uh, but they say if you do it 21 days, become a habit. Brother John, I'm going to check with you in a few weeks. You, you start a new adventure early. I'm going to check on you. Amen. They say 21 days become a habit. We can do something for so long that it become a habit for us. And it's hard to get back into rebuilding for God. And so Tobias, uh, Gisham, and Sambalik, uh, they laugh at God's people. If you're not careful, that laugh will turn you away from doing what God called you to do. I'm going to tell you how Black Baptist said, uh, the people not doing anything, they got more to say than anybody. They have a lot to complain about. And if you're not careful, those complaints can be daggers in your heart and in your spirit. And if you get enough Tobias and enough Sambalics and another Gishams against you, you'd be like, you know what? It ain't even worth it. The wall been sitting there 150 years, burnt to the ground. Nobody else wanted to build it. Hey, I, I just, I've gone back to the center there. I, as a matter of fact, I'm in the palace. You got to say, Nehemiah was in a palace working next to the king. His life was good, but Jerusalem was burnt to the ground. Don't become so comfortable that your life is good. That our kids are suffering, our city is suffering, our citizens around here are suffering, our church is suffering. It should bother us. Amen. Um, in the comments, a question about want to add that before we jump into verse 20. He said, You will rebel against the king. Th this showed that Sambalic Tobias had low view of God's authority. They were more concerned about the king than God. And, and if you're not careful, uh, we're, we're, we're spending more time trying to please people opposed to pleasing God. And we do all the time. Well, you know, some are going to be upset. You know, this, that, that, that. People ain't going to like this. People going to do that. We do it all the time. But what about making God mad? I said in my first term, I was pastoring, and, and at the time, everything went up. I said, let's go, let's go to the Bible. Let's see what the Bible say. I had, had a digger tell me, I don't care what the Bible say. There's a T in the section. To the left and right, you can go anywhere. I said, you know what? If you don't care what the Bible say, this may not be the right place for me. I said, what does the Bible say? It don't matter what the Bible say. I'm a deacon. That's back when, you know, when deacons and preachers had a lot of fights. You know, we just, we just had disagreement that. But they used to have some low-down drag outs. I know they happened up in the city up in Savannah. But in, in country churches, in family churches, amen, it was rough. And... Whatever family was a strong family, they had the same, they, they took over, they had the same person in charge, they had the same deacons, had the same chairperson, had the same trustees, the person take the money home, all that stuff. And, and you weren't going to change none of that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hand of God. Yeah, it makes a difference. Yeah, he moved me to Savannah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm not going to tell you uh, it's ever easy when the hand of God is on you. Because sometimes the hand of God could be on you. You still got to walk through the furnace. Now, they didn't smell like smoke, but just the fear of being in the fire is enough to kind of shake some of us. Now, we read the stories, oh, they didn't smell like smoke. But how many of you want to get in the fire just to test it out? I know it's talking about when we save and all this stuff, we can walk on serpents and all this stuff. Any of y'all want me, want me to bring out the rattlesnakes? We good, amen, I'm telling you. <laughs> we, we don't want all of that. We don't want the sandbags. We don't want, we don't want it to buy. We want it, God to just move, but sometimes you just have to trust his hand. You have to. Uh, and so we see here, it says, uh, will you rebel against the king? This shows up that there would be some people that's more concerned about people and, and local authority than God. I want to challenge you to make sure we put God first. Because we see how Nehemiah was blessed. He was in a good position for himself, but he went to God. He prayed, he fast, prayed, went to God, then he went to the king. Uh, you know, even, even as pastor here, you know, I, I'm, I'm far from being a king. I'm, I'm definitely not a God, but I at least want the respect of running by me first. And I believe by Nehemiah, what, what if Nehemiah had took it upon himself and said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to sneak out and go on over to Jerusalem and do it on my own and come back and say, look what I've done. He probably wouldn't have made it at the palace. Sometimes we, if we put God first and, 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 and go through the, and, you know, even on your job, you run by the balls first, you, you may not have to fill out the paperwork. But if you be sick every week and, and, and you have to bury more grandmamas than, you, than God done gave you, <laughs> you won't make it to retirement because God said, you know what, you want favor of a few things. I can't make you rule over many. We have, and we get close to the end here. Uh, verse 20, Nehemiah answer his opposition. Uh, he answers his opponents. And, and, and listen, sometimes you have to deal with those tough situations. Conflict will not resolve itself. Sometimes you have to, you have to sometimes answer your opposition. Even when you don't want to, when it hurts, it may not be popular, but sometimes you have to. But Nehemiah had to answer. He said, so I answered them and said to them, he didn't say Nehemiah, he said the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Nehemiah didn't try to say, oh, this is what I'm going to do. He said the God of heaven will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. This don't mean nothing to you. God may not mean nothing to you, but he's everything to us. Jerusalem means nothing to you, but it's everything to us. He said, he said to them, Nehemiah did not give a point by point reply. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't chase every rabbit. He just said, listen, if God be for us, who can be against us? And I want to challenge you, those that's watching today, and, and, and those whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, those that's here tonight, I want you to understand God will take care of you. God will take care of you in the midst of your re rebuilding process. God will take care of you. He said, we, his servants, will arise and build. God will take care of Nehemiah, proclaim who he was and what he would do. I'm a child of God. I hate to tell you like this. I'm not boasting, bragging, or being conceited or anything. You don't have to like me. But God's going to take care of me. And you can tell anybody the same thing. You, you can try to stop me. You can put barricades. Me. If God be for me. See, that's what y'all tell Because I'm a child of God. Nobody didn't say, listen, I work for the king. You know how some people want to throw their weight around their position. Oh, I work for the king. I worked here. I worked there. I've been there 30, 40 years. No, he said, I'm a child of God. When you let people know who you are, uh, and, and you don't have to always verbally say it because some people can get that twist. They, well, I, I'm, I'm a Christian. You ain't got to tell them. They can just see it. God say, I'll make your enemies your footstool. So thank you for joining us tonight. I hope and pray that as you prepare to rebuild your wall, there's a couple of things I want to highlight tonight as they, as they say in the in, in workshop and training, some takeaways. Make sure you go to God first. Start at the top and go down. Don't start at the bottom and go up. And also, make sure you put God first. You can't tell everybody what you're going to do. And remember, 
If God be for you, nobody can be against you. God bless you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank those here in the building tonight. Hope God bless you just as much as bless me as I prepare for this. And know that the best is yet to come, and God is getting ready to rebuild your wall. God, thank you once again for this lesson tonight. We pray for those that watched, took part in, uh, whether on YouTube, Facebook, or in the building. Bless them in a special way. Every wall that the enemy has destroyed and burnt down and thought it was in ruins, God, we begin to rebuild it afresh, anew, like never before, and let it stand like never before. For you said your word, he said, upon this rock, I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we speak of that tonight. We speak it into existence. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you, and have a wonderful night. Next week.